And our first presentation for the afternoon session is uh, by the three researchers, uh, Ashlyn Gallo, Ryan Hardy, and Zachary Varnaskis. And uh, they're presenting their work entitled, In Adult Runners, Can Varying Foot Strike Pattern Reduce Risk of Repetitive Stress Injuries? Their faculty advisor was Dr. Elizabeth Montemagny, and their reader was Dr. Timothy Swenson. Thank you, Dr. Shevin, for the introduction. As we all know, running regularly has many health benefits. However, many runners experience frequent pain or injuries related to this physical activity. Runners will often predominantly use a certain foot strike pattern, which causes an overload of a specific group of musculature and soft tissues over time. There is a known association between different foot strike patterns and repetitive stress injuries due to this differing muscular activation. A repetitive stress injury occurs over a period of time where tissue degradation outpaces the symptoms, leaving a muscle vulnerable to injury after overuse. Some factors contributing to tissue overload are running biomechanics, inadequate rest, and older age, because as we age, our connective tissue becomes less efficient at shock absorption, which leads to higher incidences of repetitive stress injuries. There are three predominant foot strike patterns that may be observed in runners. The first and the most common is a rear foot strike in which the heel makes contact with the ground while dorsiflexed. The second most common is a forefoot strike in which the forefoot and toes contact the ground first and plant our flexion. Less commonly used is a mid foot strike pattern, which is extremely rare. So we decided to exclude runners with this strike pattern from our research. Next slide, please. Our patient is a 51 year old female triathlete with chronic bilateral heel pain who presented to the clinic with bilateral Achilles tender to palpation and increased thickness. Signs and symptoms were consistent with Achilles tendinopathy and plantar fasciitis. The patient reported pain with all weight bearing, running, and jumping to, due to this heel pain. Her gait analysis also revealed a hard rear foot strike at initial contact. Despite suggestions from her physical therapist for conservative treatment and rest, the patient continued to run at a normal mileage. To meet her patient preferences, we decided it would be best to modify the biomechanics of running instead of discontinuing her training to treat signs and symptoms in the clinic. Therefore, the purpose of this research was to determine if varying foot strike pattern in adult long distance runners would mitigate the risk for repetitive stress injuries. Next slide, please. Research in this area has not been explored in depth and therefore required a broad set of inclusion and exclusion criteria to accurately include articles relevant to our 51 year old female runner. The term runner is not standardized across literature, hence its operational definition was subjects running five miles per week, three days per week, or 60 minutes per week. Specific comorbidities included current or previous lower extremity surgery, fractures, and ligamentous injury. A total of four final search trainings were used, including biomechanics and strike pattern, foot strike pattern and impact reduction, foot strike pattern and running and injury, as well as foot strike pattern and force or load. These trainings led to 338 initial articles, which trickled down to nine full text articles being appraised, where six of these articles were used for a final clinical decision. Next slide, please. Four cohort studies, one intervention study, and one systematic review with meta-analysis were used for a final clinical decision. Almeida et al.'s systematic review clarified significant differences in loading and biomechanics between each strike pattern, such as greater total ground reaction forces in rear foot strike, whereas forefoot strike causes an isolated increase in Achilles tendon and plantar flexor loading, also supported by Almond Rotor and Young. Evidence from Futrell et al. concluded that altering foot strike pattern is more reliable than training for increased cadence, which naturally increases the age. Pizza et al. and our key article from Giandolini et al. showed that runners using a varying surface such as an outdoor trail led to reduced acute and delayed fatigue, as well as decreased musculoskeletal pain as a result of varying foot strike pattern on these surfaces. Next slide, please. Based on our article analysis, we concluded four results which dictated our clinical decision. Uh, so the four foot strike relies on the Achilles and posterior calf musculature to disperse forces while the rear foot strike disperses forces through the plantar fascia and the anterior knee, all of which become common sites for RSI depending on strike pattern. In our Giandolini article, where the participants were trail running, the environment influenced the strike pattern, and the researchers found that the runners with the greatest variance between rear foot and forefoot striking actually had the least amount of pain and lower extremity fatigue, opposed to those who ran with a predominant rear foot or forefoot strike. A strengthening program is necessary before gait retraining to prep the underutilized musculature for increased activation and force absorption.
Our clinical decision was to recommend a gait retraining program for the preparatory strengthening phase, focusing on varied foot strike pattern and emphasizing redistribution of forces to limit overuse of a particular muscular group. Next slide, please. It is important to note that our patient is a triathlete and with many athletes, they want to continue their sport, sometimes against medical advice. So our treatment is a modification to her running biomechanics as she has shown and demonstrated that she's going to run anyways. This foot strike pattern training modification may be difficult to implement into the clinic uh, because it is difficult to think about how to run while you're running. But if this program is successful, has potential as a long-term solution for our patient. And that's all. A question from the chat. Um, um, first one from Carolyn Trottier. Can this relate to how fast you run? For example, trying to sprint or increase speed while doing a rear foot pattern and kind of question two related. At what extent can we truly change how someone runs? Is this a motor run behavior that will always regress when we are tired after the fourth mile? So uh, in, in relation to how fast you run, um, the, we're, we're more so talking not about sprinting, but more in like a steady state, uh, like jogging type uh, scenario. Um, so the biomechanics between sprinting and uh, like steady state running is different if, if that's what the question is. Um, and then to what extent uh, can we change how someone runs? So we actually, in uh, our like implementation of this, we had talked about using um, different pairs of shoes. So like a lower, more minimal uh, zero drop shoe would facilitate more of a forefoot strike, while a higher cushioned, uh, higher drop shoe facilitating more of a rear foot strike. And then using those as uh, tools in the early phase to uh, get the change in foot strike pattern, uh, opposed to like changing as you're going. We also thought it would be beneficial to use an external cue. Um, and we have seen in our research that if you're trying to change someone's cadence, they will often use a beat um, and a certain kind of music to help them stick to that cadence. So we were thinking that we would do um, a similar idea with the music and when the music changes or when the beat changes, um, they would have to you know, change to that foot strike pattern just as another external cue to remind them because it, it is a learned behavior that they're used to doing. So sometimes they just need that extra push. Good, and I think you answered Dr. Futrell's question. Um, next question, if the patient does not have access to a safe trail and does not feel comfortable running on a trail, do you have any recommendations on how these patients can vary their strike patterns? Um, so I think it was similar to what we had just talked about. They can, um, they can learn the change foot strike patterns and then kind of enforce that with different shoe wear or with external cueing. We aren't really expecting our patients to go and trail run. Um, most of the runners do run on flat ground. Um, so it would just have to be like a learned experience. Next question. You talked about doing preliminary strengthening prior to the new gait training. What kind of exercises do you recommend? So ideally, uh, before implementing this change in running, we would want to do the strengthening program. Uh, with both local and regional strengthening so that we can uh, train the whole lower extremity uh, and the kinematic chain so that our female triathlete is ready to continue running. So ideally, we would be training with um, endurance training and strengthening as well as um, focusing on flexibility as well because our patient's lack of dorsiflexion as well, along with a lot of other runners uh, leads to these uh, re uh, repetitive stress injuries. So we'd like to focus on endurance strengthening as well as flexibility throughout the whole lower extremity. Next question. Did you find any research, any research comparing a patient's resting foot posture and how the correction of any abnormal foot postures can impact foot strike pattern? Um, I don't believe that any of the articles that we looked at were looking at um, resting foot posture. 
Um, it is possible that depending on the bony structure of the foot, they may choose to um, use one foot strike pattern over the other, but it wasn't something that was researched in our case. Next question. Did you find in, um, in your research, any research indicating injury rates across varying surfaces, i.e. trail running versus track versus road? And would you recommend one over the other? I believe our research wasn't necessarily uh, tailored toward what uh, what type of ground that you were running on, but our key findings did uh, align with which foot strike pattern leads to certain patterns of repetitive stress injury. So as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, if you use a four foot strike, um, there's isolated increase in uh, the Achilles tendon as well as the plantar flexor uh, musculature. So there would be um, repetitive stress injuries such as Achilles tendinopathy as well as a uh, um, gastrocnemius um, strains and then if you have a rear foot strike pattern then that also uh, leads towards plantar fasciitis however this didn't really focus on what type of ground that the runners were using it appears that the foci in this literature were on the issues of muscular fatigue and soft tissue pain or injury what's the relationship to the skeletal system and the possibility that the self-selected pattern reflects elements of bony and joint configuration as well. Is there a risk of a different type of long-term injury associated with a different learned pattern? Um, I think that it's important that before this gait retraining program starts, that there is a musculoskeletal exam that goes on um, just to kind of review the patient's lower extremity to see if there are any um, abnormal, you know, bony joint um configurations to see if maybe changing their foot strike pattern could cause long-term injury. Um, you want to make sure that they are comfortable using it and that doing so wouldn't damage their joints or their muscles any further. And that's part of the reason why we also wanted to implement the strengthening program beforehand to make sure that the muscles that aren't used to being activated during running were able to maintain that load. In the literature that you used isolate foot strike has the variable being manipulated or was footwear, cadence, training surface also intervened upon in the participants? Uh, in the articles that we looked at, foot strike was typically a variable that was measured, um, but it wasn't necessarily the one being manipulated. Um, so footwear was, um, we, or we looked more so at like cohort uh, studies where they would have them do runs and they would attach uh, like sensors, various sensors on the lower extremity. And then after the run, uh, determine the, the strike pattern uh, throughout the run. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily the variable being manipulated in the studies. Um, but yeah, some of them did also look at uh, cadence and footwear as well. Great, and one last question. Uh, when would you implement this type of training with music and external cues in an episode of CARE? I'm also curious how long it would take to consistently and accurately change a patient's foot strike pattern. Um, I think that in your episode of CARE with a patient, um, like I said, you wanna first do the strengthening program and then you could move on to um, gait training on a treadmill. Um, if that's available to you in the clinic, um, and then just trying to show them how to accurately use foot strike patterns. Um, since they're not used to using them, you want to make sure that they're doing them accurately and also safely. All right, thank you. And uh, great presentation. If our next set of presenters could unmute themselves, we'll move on. Our next presentation will be uh, done by the three researchers, Haley Arbor, Robert Gaston, and Morgan Lemke. And they're presenting their work entitled, In Athletes with Unspecified Anterior Hip Pain, How Does a Multimodal Eccentric-Based Treatment Compare to Stretch and Strengthening to Decrease Pain? Their faculty advisor was Dr. Elizabeth Montemagny, and their reader was Dr. Timothy Swenson. Anterior hip pain, referred to as AHP, is a broad symptom that is associated with different pathologies, such as FAI, labral tears, adductor strain or tendinopathy, and athletic pubalgia. 
AHP is due to trauma or repetitive movements via shearing forces from dynamic motions such as kicking, twisting, cutting, sprinting, and butterfly positioning. Treatments found for AHP included interventions such as soft tissue massage, joint mobilizations, and exercise training, among others. Although treatment varies among clinicians, it is typically conservative through stretch and strengthening. However, protocols are unclear. AHP is common among the athletic population, but in up to 30% of cases, there is no formal diagnosis. Hockey goalies are at an increased risk for AHP due to the rapid abnormal movements of the butterfly position, which are extension, adduction, and internal rotation. Within hockey players, AHP is the second leading cause of mispractice. Next slide, please. The inspiration behind this research is our patient. Our patient is a 17-year-old male hockey goalie who is presented to outpatient physical therapy with a chief complaint of left anterior hip pain that worsens with activity and has persisted for two months, which has limited his sport participation. The patient demonstrated decreased left hip extension, abduction, and external rotation, which can be anticipated due to the butterfly position our patient spends a lot of time in as a hockey goalie. Decreased proprioception with left side kneeling and impaired balance with left lower extremity weight bearing were also noted. The patient's goal is to return to sport without pain as soon as possible. The patient goal and findings along with background information led us to our research question stated on the slide. Next slide, please. Our inclusion criteria contain pathologies that result in AHP that Morgan previously mentioned. We also limited ourselves to studies regarding the athletic population and that used a multimodal or eccentric based treatment plan. We excluded pathologies that resulted in surgery, were congenital, or were neuromuscular in nature. This included fractures, cerebral palsy, arthritis, and congenital hip dysplasia, among others. We also excluded articles not originally in English, published before 2009, and or editorial or expert opinion articles. Our final search string was made with this in consideration, and Sinol, Cochrane, Sport Discus, Rehab and Sports Medicine, and Medline Complete were then utilized. Next slide, please. We found 386 articles using these databases, of which nine met the initial criteria at the title and abstract level, and after further review, eight were included in the study. Three of the included studies were systematic reviews, one was an RCT, two were case studies, and two were case series. It is important to note that some of the systematic reviews were based on low, lower quality studies. Articles included anterior hip pain, iliopsoas tendinopathy, adductor tendinopathy, and athletic pubalgias are primary diagnoses. The topics of these studies were largely focused on the multimodal aspect of treatment with the dosage of modalities being unclear in several. Only one study had a strong focus on eccentric-based exercise, although all included eccentric exercise in some form. Next slide, please. Overall, there was little consistency among studies. Multimodal treatment showed short-term benefits when it came to decreasing pain and return to sport. However, there was no difference in long-term outcomes. When multimodal treatment was applied, Passive therapies were used as initial treatment to decrease pain and progress the patient towards higher level activities. Throughout the studies, there was not adequate research showing that eccentric exercise was more effective than other types of muscle activation. Exercises were poorly described in the studies, and specific protocols for treatment, both passive and active, were lacking. Next slide, please. Although there was variability, there were similarities among studies. Common exercises included adductor squeezes, lunges, and general core stability. The type of activation is not as important as targeting the necessary muscles. However, although it was not highlighted in our research, there is literature that shows the benefits of eccentric exercise and rehab, which clinicians should consider in their plan of care. Common passive therapies include soft tissue massage, joint mobilizations, and electrical stimulation. We came to the conclusion that multimodal therapy is beneficial for decreasing pain when passive therapies are utilized in the initial stages of treatment. It would be interesting to see future research comparing multimodal eccentric treatment to just eccentric exercises to determine the true effectiveness of multimodal care. We would now like to open the floor to questions. Um, I'll start with a question. Um, 
you know, your study, your study was really looking at eccentric exercise. And from a physiological point of view, what about eccentric exercise do you think would be different than concentric exercise or other types of um, modalities um, to decrease pain and or change the tissue? So we found um, additional articles that were mostly looking at eccentric exercises and how it was used in rehab. And as we know, it's used a lot in treating tendinopathy. Um, because of just the different effects that it has on the muscles, it's adding a different load and that could be um, helping more for the rehabilitation process. Um, I guess my question dig deeper and says, what is it, how is eccentric different than concentric at the muscle level? So what we had in the other articles that we found is it just provided a different type of load and there was different changes. We didn't look as much into that in our specific research, but it was the additional ones that we had found that just showed that there was benefits. Um, and the exact muscle level, I don't think I could tell you that right now, but there are studies out there that do show that it is beneficial. Thank you. Oh, and then some questions from the chat. Uh... From Dr. Shevin, if the hip problem is load-based, why not do load-reducing activities as an intervention? So when we were starting our research, um, we were looking into, we wanted to find intervention studies that would best help our patient get uh, return to sport as soon as possible. Um, and he more so presented with the hip pain at first. So we, when we were initially doing our background research, we were looking at that as a symptom and trying to treat that um, and how clinicians were treating that pain and when we were coming across it more so showed up with the strengthening and the multimodal more so than focusing on load. Great. Question from the chat from Dr. Futrell. Based on your research, can you give us a few examples of exercises you would use for your patient case? So as I had mentioned, there was a lot of variability in the studies with what exercises they used. But the common ones that were used were um, adductor squeezes. So those were utilized in different forms. Um, one of them, they, it was just using an isometric hold with a soccer ball in between the knees in a hook line position. Um, that was just one that we saw kind of common just because it was targeting that specific muscle. Um, some other ones were targeting the abductor muscles. So more just glute bridges and clamshells. Um, question from Olivia Seely in the chat: Is there a specific combination? Is there specific combinations of treatments recommended for a multimodal approach based on the research? That was also something that we had struggled to find one set protocol. Each of the studies used different multimodal treatments in their research, so it was very hard to tell which one was the most effective. Some of them used. Um, ice or heat with electrical stimulation, some use soft tissue massage and acupuncture. acupuncture. So it was kind of hard to know which one was the most effective. Great, and a follow up from Dr. Fuchel, are there any examples of eccentric emphasis exercises? So our study that uh, focused heavily on the eccentric exercises mainly use um, a band system in order to load the hip in that eccentric fashion. Um, Within, outside of using the bands, there wasn't as much uh, way to focus solely on that eccentric movement other than uh, just having that emphasis during the exercise treatment. Great. From Dr. Shevin, can you operationalize multimodal? What are the passive interventions? So we considered multimodal therapy, any type of therapy that included um, passive interventions such as soft tissue massage, um, different modalities such as e-stim and um, ultrasound, along with strengthening exercises. So as long as it included um, both of those aspects and we considered it multimodal. Great. Any other questions? Thank you. Move on to our next presentation group. If you could please unmute yourselves.
Our next research is presented by Andrew Hanks, Isabella Inglesi, and Daryl Gent, and they did their work asking the question, does respiratory muscle training increase pulmonary function in children with spastic cerebral palsy? Their faculty advisor was Dr. Don Roberts, and their reader was Dr. Samantha Rockwood. Thank you, Dr. Shevin. Cerebral palsy, or CP, is a neurological disorder caused by permanent injury to a developing brain with resulting movement to the system impairments. CP is often functionally classified by the GMFCS scale, one being the lowest severity, patients who are independent ambulators, and five being the highest severity, patients who are completely dependent. Children with CP commonly experience impaired pulmonary function due to respiratory muscle weakness, increased tone, uncoordinated breathing patterns, and thoracic cage hypomobility. It is important to note that these factors are all intertwined together, and it is unlikely to find a child who possesses only one of these factors. The graphic on the right provides a visual for this idea. When compared to age match controls without the condition, children with CP display lower dynamic lung volumes and lung pressures. Research displays a correlation of these physiologic pulmonary outcomes with trunk control, motor function, and daily living function. Despite this, decreased pulmonary function remains an aspect of patient management that is often unaddressed. Next slide, please. Our patient is a three-year-old male and has a diagnosis of spastic quadriplegic CP. He's classified as a level three on the GMFCS scale. This alludes to his ambulation status in which he requires the assistance of a therapeutic suit, reverse walker, and bilateral solid AFOs to ambulate. Currently, this patient displays difficulty with breathing and speech reduction while standing or maintaining difficult postures. Subsequently, his therapist has included a specific goal relating to increasing speech production and breathing skills within his plan of care. Resultantly, the purpose of this research is to determine if respiratory muscle training in conjunction with standard physical therapy care improves pulmonary function in children with spastic CP when we compare it to strictly standard care alone. Next slide, please. The final search string that is utilized is as listed on the graphic in the bottom of the tier. The databases we use to research our clinical question are located on the left side of the graphic. After using this search string with these databases, we were able to produce a total of 387 total hits. After screening the abstracts, it was revealed that 18 articles were relevant to the clinical question. Thorough reading of the 18 relevant articles produced seven articles that met inclusion criteria. Next slide, please. The chart on the slide depicts the seven studies that met the inclusion criteria and a few other characteristics as well. All of the seven articles that were found relevant were RCTs, so level one evidence. The three studies by Rothman, Shin, and Santosh at the bottom were excluded due to methodological flaws, leaving four articles remaining, which had an average PAGER score of 6.5. It is really important to note that each article focused on a unique intervention, assessed different outcomes, and included participants of different GMFCS levels. Therefore, this made it really difficult to single out one intervention and honor it as the best in improving dynamic lung volumes and pulmonary function outcomes. The Intervention that Kiel et al. used was inspiratory muscle training, abbreviated as IMT, involves resisted diaphragmatic inhalation at a submaximal volume with resistance set at 30% MIP. The control group performed sham IMT at 5% resistance. Lee et al. utilized feedback respiratory training, which involved coordinating maximal inhalation and exhalation with visual cues at a 14 to 15 breaths per minute rate. Next, Quan et al. used task-specific movement patterns during resistance exercise, which was abbreviated as BEST, where they added a weighted vest during standard therapy, starting at 0.5% of body weight and increasing to 20%. Resistance was increased when the children could perform 8 to 10 reps without fatigue. And finally, Choi et al. used incentive spirometry exercise, which requires maximal volume inhalation at a sustained flow rate followed by a normal exhale, using a handheld spirometer device. It is important to understand the protocol of each exercise as improvements in various measures of pulmonary function and dynamic lung volumes occurred based upon the, um, the areas targeted by each intervention. Next slide, please. So overall, we found that RMT does improve pulmonary function, uh, but the outcomes that are or are not improved depend on the specificity of the intervention protocol used. Um, interventions that primarily target motor control of maximal inhalation, such as ISC and FRT, that were able to improve forced vital capacity. Uh, these interventions also include rapid exhaling, hence the improvement in FEV1. Uh, IMT did not improve FBC or FEV1 because IMT does not require breathing at maximal volume. Uh, 
Uh, however, improvements in muscle strength measured by the maximal inspiratory pressure occurred following resisted inspiration of IMT. Um, the vest helped improve thoracic mobility, which explains the large increase in FBC, but it also improves strength and coordination of accessory muscles, uh, particularly the rectus abdominis, which is likely responsible for the increase in FEV1 and PEF. Uh, one outcome of interest, the maximal phonation time, which is the time that the participant could sustain a vowel sound, uh, was improved by Choi, and we believe it shows clear progress towards our patient's goal. Next slide, please. So we found that GMFCS level plays a large role in choosing an intervention. Uh, children who don't rely on assistive devices to ambulate have higher pulmonary function at baseline, and there may be a ceiling effect with ISC and FRT. Um, in that case, IMT, uh, which was studied in a population of GMFCS 1 and 2, might be better. Um, well, we do know that we can improve pulmonary function values, uh, the impact on function and quality of life need further study. Uh, the ISC group did not show uh, greater functional improvements in the control group, but in the IMT study, the experimental group improved the six minute walk distance, uh, measures of trunk control and social well-being acceptance more than the control group. Um, it's important to note that these interventions don't take away from valuable in-clinic treatment time. Uh, spirometer exercise can be performed at home, and the spirometer on the right, uh, used by uh, Choi, costs as little as six dollars. Uh, overall, we believe that our patient would benefit the most from ISE, as it's the same sample uh, that included our patient population. It's easy to perform, low risk, low cost, and may help with the goal of improving speech production and breath control. Great, a few questions um, from Dr. Campbell. Is there a concern about the oral motor development in a three-year-old with or without CP to use um, a mouthpiece? Um, in my own personal research while we were doing this project, I did find that the oral development is supposed to be fully established and developed around three years of age. Um, it wasn't really assessed in any of our articles, and it was difficult to find articles with children that are under the age of three or even under the age of five. So it didn't come up as a concern in our study, but I would presume that there would not be any issues. A question from Dr. Shevin. Can you clarify if effect size or MCID was measured for any of the noted improvements? So uh, one article, the article by Lee et al., did look at an effect size for FVC, uh, which I believe was 3.1 at a level of um, less than 0.05. Um, there weren't any MCIDs for any of these pulmonary function values because there's not much um, literature on um, the actual functional implications of that. Uh, so we'd like to see more research on that. From Dr. Campbell, I, IMT has a category usually involves resistance above and beyond incentive spirometry. Was that a factor in your research or recommendations? Yeah, so that's definitely something we looked at. We found that, as I said before, the incentive spirometer, which doesn't have resistance, focused more on the motor control of maximal inhalation, which helped to kind of expand the lungs, help with the dynamic lung volumes, such as FBC versus IMT, which is resistance, helped more with the strengthening. Um, and how we would apply that is um, kids who are ambulatory without devices uh, usually don't have as much issues with FVC. Uh, they may benefit more from strengthening uh, with the IMT versus kids who are not ambulatory and may need improvements in FVC in which incentive spirometry might be better. Dr. Shevin, your work focused heavily on the literature. Can you clarify how this might actually be implemented and how you would work on the third arm of EBP patient preference? Yeah, so I, I could kind of talk. You want to there? I'll go for it. <laughs> I go for it, yeah. So uh, in regards to the third arm of uh, EBP with patient preference, um, we didn't talk about it in this presentation, but the patient's social environment at home is very conducive to um, creating uh, regular adherence and regular attendance to therapy sessions. So um, the mother was described as being kind of 
um, about anything that would help her son. So I think a conversation with her um, and then kind of trying different ways to be creative with it inside the clinic would be able to provide a way to give the child something that he might be more interested in at home because it is a pediatric uh, case. So creativity and um, attention to the actual intervention is important. Great, from Jennifer, in your research, did you come across any evidence of long-term changes versus short-term benefits from any of the interventions? Um, the longest intervention that we had was by Quan et al. and the research went on for 12 weeks. However, it was difficult for us to compare the interventions between short-term and long-term because they were all doing different interventions and looking at different outcomes. So there were, it wasn't really an easy way for us to see any long-term change versus short-term because none of the articles went back and did it for a longer time or compared it to a shorter time. Um, Great. From Allison, did your research articles have a high amount of dropout rates, non-compliance? If so, how would you try to limit this? Um, so I know that um, there was not a high dropout rate. I believe Lee had um, two participants drop out, uh, one in each group. Uh, I know something that Choi did uh, was his intervention was performed at home, and they had the participants fill out a journal to help with adherence. And a question from Mel and or Allie. Did you come across a point in the developmental process where implementing these strategies might be too late to see improvements? Um, I think through our research, we didn't really see that. Um, I know that as uh, children with CP age, um, they're more likely to be impacted by the thoracic hypermobility, and also more likely to develop secondary conditions like scoliosis. Um, so, well, I don't know if there's something that says that it might be too late, but I definitely think that um, the earlier that you start, it could be more beneficial. And from Dr. Futrell, based on your research, do you feel you could just add the weighted vest or breathing device during the standard care? I don't believe there'd be any harm in adding the weighted vest during standard care. I believe that it was just separated in the research, obviously, just to see if it was affected. Um, I think the benefit of the breathing device is that it can be in, done in addition to standard care at home. So I think that that would be really beneficial and kind of killing two birds with one stone. Yeah, I, I also think it would be interesting to, you know, utilize a, um, a breathing device such as IMT that might uh, restrict or have some uh, resistance to inspiration while the patient is trying to maintain these difficult postures to kind of uptrain those muscles. In addition, the literature had um, like kind of the dosage was 10 sessions per day. So I think that um, in, like applying it to a home exercise program is important to make sure that if you want to go by strictly literature, that you're hitting the amount of times per day that you should be doing it. So just doing it in the clinic is um, not enough. All right, any more questions from the chat? All right, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, interesting presentation. We'll move on to our uh, next presentation. And if the next presenters could unmute themselves. So our uh, presenters, our researchers in this Final presentation for the session are uh, Griffin Bennett, Taylor Fulcrod, and Marissa Moquin. And they're going to be presenting on their research question, in adult males, are vestibular compensation exercises an effective treatment for chronic vestibular hypofunction as a result of vestibular neuritis? Uh, they were advised, their faculty advisor was Dr. Linda Sumas, and their reader was Dr. Catherine Fitzgerald. Thank you, Dr. Shevin. Vestibular neuritis, abbreviated as VN in our slides, is the inflammation of the vestibular portion of the eighth cranial nerve. It is the third most common cause of vertigo symptoms and accounts for 9% of clinic visits every year. Although the inflammation of the nerve may be alleviated, many patients have residual effects that last much longer, also known as chronic hypofunction, 
Patients that are diagnosed with VN or other unilateral vestibular disorders are generally prescribed medications such as meclizine that inhibit the vestibular system and therefore minimize symptoms. However, these drugs prevent the body from relearning how to adjust, causing symptom relief to be prolonged. Although the concept of vestibular compensation has been around since World War I, many patients are likely to be prescribed medications and never seek physical therapy treatment. Next slide, please. Our patient is a 24-year-old male who presented to the emergency department with severe dizziness, nausea, and loss of balance, where he was diagnosed with vestibular neuritis and, pres and prescribed meclizine to relieve his symptoms. Two weeks later, he presented to the PT clinic, and despite his medication ad adherence, he still had persistent symptoms. At the PT clinic, he stated his main goals for physical therapy were to get back to his everyday activities of going to the gym and walking to class without any symptoms. That being said, we saw an alternative treatment plan for him, which led us to our research question of, are our vestibular compensation exercises effective at treating vestibular hypofunction? Next slide, please. We used five search strings and databases available to us from the Springfield College Library, and the two search strings on the right are what yielded a majority of our results. We reached the saturation point at 333 articles, and we set up recurring search strings. However, we didn't gain any additional resources from that. A majority of the articles we found were excluded due to lack of applicability and not matching preset inclusion and exclusion criteria. The flowchart on the left explains our process of sifting through um, all of our search strings found, or all of the articles found with our search strings. And that same process was replicated to back reference the Hall Clinical Practice Guideline for Vestibular Rehabilitation for Peripheral Vestibular Hypofunction. That gave us one additional article to add to our clinical decision. All articles that were praised were done by two researchers and any disagreements were settled by the third. Next slide, please. Four articles were used in our final clinical decision and that was based on their relevance to the clinical question as well as low levels of bias and threats to validity. Three of our articles are intervention based and one was the clinical practice guideline mentioned earlier. We had a wide variety of interventions, comparators, and outcome measures used in the articles we found. In Marionia et al., there were three groups compared, being vestibular rehabilitation to no treatment to healthy controls. In Gudakos et al., they have the adaptation and substitution aspects of vestibular rehabilitation compared to corticosteroids. And in you et al., we used vestibular rehabilitation and ginkgo extract compared to those two things in addition to steroid therapy. All of the included articles suggest that patients with vestibular hypofunction found vestibular rehabilitation to be effective in relieving symptoms. Next slide, please. Since the four articles that we used to base our clinical decision off of had very different outcome measures, we decided to organize our results based off the patient's symptoms. That being said, vestibular exercises are just as effective as cortical steroids over time in regards to dizziness. Gudakos et al. showed a significant reduction in symptoms in both the exercise group and the control group with no difference between the groups. And vestibular rehabilitation restored patients to a healthy baseline in regards to balance. Marioni et al. showed no difference between the healthy controls in the subjects who utilize po the posturography machine to help reduce their symptoms. Next slide, please. After careful review of the literature and a vigorous appraisal process was performed, we concluded that vestibular compensation exercises provided by a physical therapist are indeed effective at relieving symptoms of chronic vestibular hypofunction. Although there's strong biological plausibility of the effectiveness of these exercises, Valid and reliable literature was limited. Many of the articles that we found, as you saw in our previous chart, have varying outcome measures, which made it difficult to compare each approach to vestibular compensation. One article that was referenced in the clinical practice guideline, written by Spare et al., used we fit age as their primary outcome measure. Even though the article was a cost-effective and enticing form of rehabilitation, this was not the most reliable measure, and the article was therefore excluded from our research. The interventions that you saw varied widely in terms of cost and equipment required, but without standardized measures, it was difficult to compare the effects between each intervention. We recommend that future research uses standardized measures across the board in order to better understand the effects of specific exercises on the resolution of symptoms. Once more research is done with measures standardized across the board, therapists can then compare and determine which interventions are most effective at relieving symptoms while simultaneously being the most cost-effective for the clinic. We would like to take this time to thank Dr. Linda Sumas for her guidance and advising during this process, Dr. Catherine Fitzgerald for providing the patient case, 
And finally, the patient himself for allowing us to use his information to create our research question. We would now like to open the floor to questions. From Dr. Sumas, based on your research, what standardized measures do you recommend for clinicians to incorporate? So the outcome measures that were used, um, the SOT is considered the gold standard. However, that can cost anywhere from $80,000 to $180,000 to implement all the technology. Um, so we found that the MCTSIB is much more widely used across physical therapy as well as other disciplines. From Dr. Shevin, do the therapeutic activities eliminate the symptoms? Are the studies short-term or long-term in their approaches to measuring the outcomes? So the timelines for each of the interventions varied a little bit. Um, the Marioni article, which utilized computerized posturography, was a five-week study, whereas Budegos et al. was 12 weeks. Um, and these exercises did indeed um, kind of minimize the symptoms that the patient was experiencing, including dizziness and loss of balance. Um, implementing these in the clinic could take as short as, like we said, five weeks, or they may take longer depending on the patient's adherence to the exercises, um, as well as the ability for the brain's um, neuroplasticity to be able to adapt to the different stimuli that we are um, enticing them to use. From Dr. Kaufman, what is the operational definition of vestibular compensation? How do the approaches used in the literature you examine reflect the operational definition? So vestibular compensation as defined in the clinical practice guideline by Hall et al. was using adaptation and substitution exercises to either retrain the vestibular system to respond to um, different stimuli or training the other two systems of balance such as the somatosensory and the visual symptoms to kind of make up for the loss of the vestibular system that our patient had. So some of our exercises were using simple head turns in order to um, in, have the stimulus be affecting the patient or having substitution, so up training the visual system or the somatic sensory systems um, using different visual cues or different um, floor feelings as the computerized posturography utilized in order to train those systems to make up for the vestibular loss. Any other questions? Can you explain why ginkgo extract was used? That's from Morgan. So ginkgo extract was used. It is, it's just like a supplement and it's used, it's been shown to be beneficial in vestibular rehab and uh, we didn't think it affected the outcomes at all just because they gave it to both groups. So one group uh, wasn't, so neither group was either uh, like benef benefited by it or worsened by the results. So that's why we figured the ginkgo extract portion wasn't going to affect the outcome measures too much. From Dr. Barrett, given your research, when you go to clinic, which treatment and which outcome measures would you use for this patient type? I think for our patient, specifically using the VOR1 and VOR2, as well as having him do walking with head turns um, in the figure eight pattern would be beneficial for him just because he did note that most of the symptoms happened when he was at the gym or when he was moving. So just anything that gets the movement involved with it. When we were presented with the patient, we also got his dynamic gait index score, which was a 12 out of 24. So in terms of outcome measures, we could implement that again after we do our interventions to see if there is indeed a change in his ability to maintain his balance during movement. The DHI is also a good outcome measure to use because it looks at how the patient perceives his symptoms and how it affects his daily life. So being able to monitor how he's seeing his symptoms improve over time is another beneficial way that we can uh, really track his progress and he can see how much better he's getting throughout the treatment sessions. No more questions in the chat. Oh, sorry, one more from Dr. Kaufman. Uh, 
I'm curious about the differential diagnosis for your particular patient. Remind me at what point post onset he was seen in PT. So, so he, he was presented, done. <laughs> he presented to the PT clinic two weeks after going to the emergency room. So he had more of like a chronic hypofunction by the time that the physical therapist saw him. Yeah, unless there's a follow up, oh, sorry, there is a follow up. Yeah, and does a differential diagnosis make a difference according to the literature, even in considering solely peripheral issues? So some of our literature did um, limit some of the different peripheral issues that we have seen. Um, for example, some of our articles that we saw eliminated people with hearing loss in order to exclude diagnoses such as Meniere's disease. Um, this actually proved to be a little bit difficult for us because our patient did use hearing aids that was unrelated to the vestibular issue. Um, so yes, yeah, some of the differential diagnosis pieces did make a difference in terms of the articles that we were able to utilize that were most applicable to our patient. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we are just completing session two and we are going to regroup at noon for the final research presentation session. Thank you to all the participants and all the presenters.